morning and welcome to St. Jacob. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are so glad that you are here today. Today our focus is on the Gospel lesson and we're asking another question of the Master Jesus and a young man uh, who happened to be fairly wealthy asked Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And we're going to examine that question uh, in our sermon and uh, hear that in the Gospel lesson. We begin by singing our opening hymn. That's if God himself before me. We'll sing the first five verses of him 419. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth, 
may not the slaves I have sinned against you, and do not deserve to be called your child. Mother, trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
chapter 3, reading verses 1 through 6. How will we resist the glitter of gold and the honey taste of luxury, pleasure and ease that so easily become God's and drive all the thought of bearing the cross? The Hebrew writer says, fix your thoughts on Jesus. And that's really the ultimate goal. It's good to have things in life, and a lot of it we couldn't live without. But ultimately, we fix our eyes on Jesus. We read from Hebrews 3. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, focus your attention on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to the one appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in God's whole house. In fact, Jesus is worthy of greater glory than Moses, in the same way that the builder of a house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, and God is the one who built everything. Moses was faithful as a servant within the, God's whole house, by testifying to the things that would be spoken. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. We are his house, if we hold on firmly to our confidence and the hope about which we will boast until the end. This is the epistle of our Lord. Hallelujah, this is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Hallelujah. hard for a rich man to uh, enter the kingdom of God. 
and to for a camel to go off through an eye of a needle as an illustration. But help us not to rely on our riches, not on what we have or own or possess or cherish, except for you. Help us rely on you and faith in you through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we are saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. The Holy Gospel is recorded in Mark chapter 10, reading verses 17 through 27. God's gifts of wealth uh, uh, gives us gifts of wealth more uh, than many other nations, and most of those gifts can be snares to our salvation when we treasure them more than the giver, more than the salvation. And we have a lot of treasures on this earth, and, it, and it's really hard, maybe sometimes, to to understand that. Our life doesn't depend on those things, and ultimately it never should. It drives us to the point of salvation to say that there's nothing we can do, that we should trust only in God, and that it's by faith that we are saved. We read from uh, Mark chapter 10. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, one man ran up to him and knelt in front of him. He asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, Teacher, I have kept all these since I was a child. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, One thing you lack. Go sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he looked, looked sad and went away grieving, because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus told them again, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in their riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished, and they said to one another, Who, can then, be, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For people it is impossible, but not for God, because all things are possible for God. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
gospel lesson once again, and we continue with our series on Ask the Master. Today we will look at another question asked of the Master, Jesus. This question haunts many of us. It is a question that focuses on our ultimate goal of uh, everlasting life. Once again, we ask the Master for our answer, for we know that he has come to seek and to save the lost. At birth, we were lost, but the Lord Jesus Christ found us. So we are safe, secure, and his forever. But still our human nature persists in asking, what shall I do to be saved? The question, what must I do to be saved, is basic to us all. Today we meet a, a, a focused young man who had great wealth, and yet he has an earnest interest in great truths such as eternal life, and he was earnestly seeking an answer to his, this vital question. He was not like a, uh, the self-righteous expert in the law who was trying to test Jesus. This man was honestly searching uh, how to obtain the, treasure, the, the, the ultimate treasure from this rabbi or teacher. But he has not yet found the answer, and so he assumes that Jesus has the answer to this very important question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I would be surprised if this is the first time that this young man asked this question, because something like this just doesn't pop into one's head. He's a man on a mission. One can imagine that this young man was searching out teachers of faith, asking questions about life's deepest truths, and we can imagine that at least once, uh, uh, one of his teachers may have told him, Son, if you want eternal life, if you want to be blessed in your life by God and live in his favor, then follow his teachings. Commit uh, yourself to the, to the task of doing his will and do your best to obey his commands. If you do this, you will have everything you desire, a happy life, a meaningful existence, and you will make a difference. Our sinful nature also wants an answer to our question today, what must I do to inherit eternal life? All the world's religions profess to have an answer to that question, though their view of what eternal life is may vary extensively. In recent years, great fortunes have been made by some who claim to have the answer. If there were ever an answer that required, a question that required an answer, it would be this one, and we need to know the answer, uh, the correct answer to this question. We all need a trustworthy answer to this question. Uh, the wealthy young man's conscience was driving him crazy. It, it gnawed at him. It kept him up at night. It gave him distress. And that honest appraisal uh, of himself was like a grinding, persistent refrain that the taunted him. Not enough yet. You are missing something. You are lacking. And if he were satisfied, he would not have searched for Jesus to ask this question. But he does. And he wanted Jesus to validate his behavior. This man calls Jesus good teacher. You see, to him, Jesus was a good, a good teacher, but nothing more than that. And when Jesus says, no one is good except God. He was trying to lead this young man to trust in Jesus as God. Then this man's enslaving uh, chains of trust would, in himself would be removed. So Jesus recites the uh, commandments that pertain to this young man's interacting with others to break down his reliance on good deeds. He refers to these commands that show how he had failed miserably. Instead, the young man foolishly and mistakenly declares, Teacher, I have kept all these since I was a child. The man expresses not even a hint of doubt about obeying God's commands. And yet, he may have lived an exemplary life. Maybe he was often complimented for his behavior and his kindness, his obedience to authority and his clean living. Faultless in the eyes of the others, he was the young man that every Jewish mother would want as a son-in-law. And yet his limited understanding of sin allows him uh, to uh, see himself as righteous on his own. So picture a three-year-old who is with his parents and they're traveling from Michigan to California. 
and they go 100 miles, and what's the question that the child asks? Yeah, are we there yet? And it's kind of like that with this rich young man. He thought he was there yet. He thought that he had lived a good life, so he was there. And therein lies the problem. The wrong answer to this question can lead to a person being empty, waiting, and with a yearning heart and a, an accusing conscience. Many years ago, a survey was taken of Lutherans, and uh, they were asked uh, that they were uh, how uh, they were trying uh, to get to heaven, the ultimate goal of heaven and eternal life. And, and some said by living good lives, uh, obeying the commandments, or being good Christians. But if we follow that approach, then we too will live sad, hopeless lives by a futile spiritual thrashing that's like blowing in the wind. There will be no peace or rest as our conscience continues to reveal what's missing in our personal pursuit for eternal life. And then we will only find ourselves sharing excuses within ourselves and why we feel uh, wanting and whole, uh, hollow and far removed from our goal. Jesus alone has the answer. The wealthy young rich man heard of a rabbi named Jesus who performed miracles and taught about God with astounding authority. And he said, I will go to him, this money young man must have thought. Perhaps he will give me some insights that will lead to inner peace and understanding. So this young man was a man on a mission, earnestly searching for an answer. God's love produces the answer. The evangelist Mark writes, Jesus looked at him and loved him. I want you to focus on that phrase, and loved him. What a beautiful moment for us, for it reveals the wonder, the breadth, and the depth of Jesus' love for all people, even for those who don't answer the basic questions uh, of, of spiritual nature properly. What a relief for anyone or any Lutherans who may have gotten, not gotten it right either. And this might often prompt us to uh, react with more compassion for well-meaning people who have religious truths confused. And may it encourage us to dialogue with them instead of condemning them right away. And it helps me recognize that the Lord Jesus will be patient with me and all my misunderstandings. And he will with you as well. The loving answer is the gospel. Then Jesus still loving him, for Scripture does not tell us that Jesus loved him any less for misinterpreting the way to salvation. And he looks him and us in the eye and says with a quiet, loving voice, one thing you lack, go and sell whatever you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. This was the Lord's test to convince this young man that he was how far he still was from perfection, how lacking he was in knowing God and loving other people, how completely his heart was bound up in his wealth. What must you do? Are you trusting in your financial assets? What if Jesus asked you, you, uh, what must you do to be saved? How would you answer this spiritually important question? When Asked why God should let you into his heaven, many people respond like this, well, I tried to lead a good life. I, I've been uh, kind and helpful. I don't live wildly. I don't drink to excess. I don't smoke excessively. I, don't, I give a tithe with 10% to the Lord's work. At least I'm not as bad as most people. This kind of sounds like that rich young ruler that Mark's describing in our text, doesn't it? What if Jesus came to you and commanded, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me? Could you do it? By telling this rich man to sell everything, Jesus reduces this man and us to absolute zero in terms of trying to apply our good life toward actually achieving eternal life. We can't gain, obtain, or earn God's favor. We don't merit, earn, or deserve His gracious gift of heaven. God expects us to give up all our earthly possessions to follow Him completely. Did the rich man walk away forever? Or did he come back sometime and want to hear more from Jesus? We don't know. 
But while the person is alive, the door is always open. The movie Schindler's List, uh, some years ago, dramatically portrayed uh, how a man, Oscar Schindler, exploited the war for his own personal gain and wealth, but then he had a change of heart. After he uh, becomes a protector of the Jews, and he saves many of them from the gas chambers by claiming them as workers in, them, in his factory, he invites them to remember the many who died in the Holocaust. And then one of those Jews presents to Schindler a ring with the words, the words described from the Talmud. And it said, he who saves one life saves uh, a world entire. That's what God the Father did through his son Jesus. After uh, Jesus suffered God's wrath on the cross, he was resurrected by God, and thus a world was saved entire. What's your greatest treasure? Is it your house, your truck, your wardrobe, your diamond ring? Is it the property in your name, your 401k, your cottage, hunting, fishing, an heirloom, your spouse, or your children? What do you treasure the most? Riches have caused countless Christians to lose their place in God's kingdom. Scripture often warns us not to set our heart on riches. As it says, Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can take nothing out. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and trap and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge them into complete destruction and utter ruin. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, by striving for money, some men have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. The psalmist David writes, Do not trust in extortion. Do not put empty confidence in stolen goods. If your wealth grows, do not set your heart on it. And Job advises, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Jesus repeated this comment twice, how hard it is to trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. All self-righteousness and sin must be left behind to receive eternal life. Jesus then slightly changes an oriental proverb that says, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Can a camel go through an eye of a needle? No. But what Jesus means is if a person is depending on their riches or using their riches to enter the kingdom of God, then no, that will never happen. No one can buy their way into God's kingdom through money, kind acts, generosity, or a pious life. God may bless certain people like Ted Turner and, and Bill Gates and Joan Crock with a, a lot of money, for he distributes the money as he sees fit. But Christians who are rich regard themselves as stewards whom God entrusted with maybe more than others. Abraham was rich, but he believed in the Lord. Wealthy Job lost all his possessions, but not his faith in God. The disciples were shocked or knocked off their feet. This was the strongest expression of a man's utter inability to earn a salvation that they had ever heard. Good deeds don't appease God's wrath, as the holy God demands of perfection, and as Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The, man, the man, young man's radiant face suddenly turned sad, and with overcast face and a heavy heart, the man walked away, for his great wealth was his undoing, for he put his trust and his devotion in them. The price was too high for their young man because he failed to look at the prize and eternity with Jesus in heaven. Yes, for sinful humans, and that describes all of us, obeying the law is no way to arrive at eternal life because we can't do it perfectly. The law drives us to the loving answer of the gospel. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The complete answer is given by Jesus. Then come, follow me. To follow is to accept that I am no longer in charge. I have given up control. Jesus leads the way to eternal life. I will follow him 
and in following him I am given a gift. The gift is that I will live with him forever in eternity in heaven. God's grace, his love, his uh, life, his death, and his resurrection create all this. He invites all of us to follow him, and then he gives us the Spirit's power to be able to do that. The Apostle Paul knew this. He was struck down by the light from heaven, and he was ordered to follow. His exceptional knowledge of the law meant nothing when he encountered Jesus. Paul was no longer the master, he was the servant. And what Paul learned, he shared with us. Maybe you know it. Indeed, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Maybe some of you have inherited an estate from your parents or a relative. An heir doesn't uh, acquire an inheritance, nor does one deserve or earn an inheritance. A person inherits an, an estate because they are part of the family connection or the generosity of the deceased. Because of our sin, our good deeds don't earn eternal life. We receive it as a gift. What is your greatest treasure? God wants you, your treasures, your talents, your time, your uh, heart, your mind, and your soul. He wants all of you. Uh, Christian's precious treasure is Jesus Christ and the eternal life that he receives as a gift. That's the true answer, young man. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand and we'll say the Apostles' Creed as, uh, as recorded on page 41 in your hymnal or on the screen. You need to say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the couch of Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and was seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, in the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. You will have the offering for the Lord's work. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, cleanse us from all malice, from un all unholy desires and deeds, yes, from all things which would blemish our offerings brought to your altar. 
May the love and mercy and the expressions of kindness which you have ever show us strike a responsive chord in our hearts and inspire generous offerings, cheerly, cheerfully given in our Savior's name. Amen. Please stand for prayer. We'll use the responsive prayer on page 127. O oh Lord our God, we are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a sense, a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Invigorate the schools of our land, give success to every effort that help students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Give us teachers and students to pursue excellence. Strengthen the families of our country, give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. Dear Heavenly Father, today we come to you with uh, prayers for Clara, that is uh, Kevin and Joyce's granddaughter, who uh, requires surgery or tubes in her ears due to re uh, recurrent uh, ear infections. And while this may be a common su uh, surgery, and there's always the risk that things uh, go um, uh, badly, and yet we pray that uh, those uh, who are involved in the care of Clara at Hickman Hospital and Adrian uh, would uh, do their best and that all things would go well in the surgery. Uh, Clara, being uh, a young child, uh, leads us to uh, have tenderness and, and concern, and we pray uh, that uh, once again uh, uh, a, a surgery of this nature would go well. Dear Heavenly Father, we also pay, pray for uh, survivors and those dealing with the you know, tragic hurricanes that have affected the South and, and Helene and in Helene and Milton and have caused much damage and destruction and, and put many lives in uh, a lot of uh, uh, tense and uh, difficult situations. Uh, maybe we can help with alleviate some of that uh, for certain by praying. Um, maybe we can lend uh, some kind of support, although we would pray that people would be cautious in, in where that support is given, uh, give to agencies that are reputable. Uh, but we pray that it would go to help those who need it most and that uh, while it is going to be uh, quite a while of recovery and repair and rebuilding that you would inspire Christians especially to show their love for one another. We ask this in Jesus' name. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught, with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. We continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Thank you. 
may be seated, we continue by singing hymn 477. <laughs>
Yeah. Um, number of announcements. Number is going to be altered. Uh, there, given by the Galloways. There it is. I thought it should be. Mm -hmm. yes. 38 years of marriage. And the future grad from Gotcha. Good month, huh? <laughs> uh, meetings. A uh, lot of meetings this week. I'm kind of surprised because usually it's not the third week in the month. But, uh, so Tuesday we're, we're trying to gather uh, the audio video committee for uh, uh, some things on the, on the computer. Uh, the HIMSOC program. If you want to know more about that, uh, you can talk to me, Karen, Dave. Um, it's we're trying to fix it or replace it. Um, this the uh, uh, cemetery association meets Thursday at six thirty, and the book fair, the virtual one, lasts through tomorrow. Um, and you can receive a 20% discount. I'd just like to, to say that was very successful out of the 48 books that were there. Um, different people bought 36, I mean 32 of the 48, so only 16 were returned. And then there were others that bought um, online on the virtual one, so that was good. And there's another opportunity to buy a book, uh, Pictorial History of the Synod. Um, Today is kind of the last day they need to know by the 15th, so I have to send that order. And if you want to pay now, the church will pay the shipping. The book costs about $24. It's a pictorial uh, book. The Senate has really been promoting it. It celebrates the 170 year, five years of God's grace of the wealth that we will celebrate next year. Um, and I'm pretty sure St. Jacob is in it, at least somewhere. Um, Oktoberfest is next Sunday. There's a meal after the church. After the meal, there will be the <coughs> quarterly meeting. And there we will decide a number of things. Um, hopefully you will stay for that. There are some decisions to be made as far as how many times we are going to worship in the coming holiday season. Uh, so there are things that are really important that we need to discuss. Uh, the Area Reformation Service, which is also on the back, and um, I'll copy the best. But uh, that is on October 27th at 2 p.m. It's celebrating the 500th anniversary of the first Lutheran hymnal. Uh, about the book, I could read, I guess, again, I put it in there. But um, if you have any questions, uh, it, it, um, it, it uh, is, is there. I think it's going to be a wonderful book. Um, I like the idea that it has pictures. <laughs> Because it's the kid in me, but <laughs> pictures are a good thing. Any announcements from the group? Okay, none. Um, I'll reach you on the way out and uh, assure you uh, that it's not what you do, but who you believe in, and that you are safe. <laughs>